And I'm, it's, I'm going to move on now to um, just running through some program numbers, but I'll, I'll take a pause here and see in case there were any questions about the PFAS information. Yeah, there's a question on the chat from Michelle O'Brien. Is a residential property owner tenant, if a residential property owner tenant denies access to a PRP for sampling a drinking water source, what does DEP do? Um, we, we, we do a number of different things. I think, uh, we try to, um, we try to continue to pursue access. We, uh, we will work with the board of health, for example, uh, get them involved, um, in case that's helpful. Uh, we will continue to, to, um, sample neighboring properties. So if, if, we are moving out from a known known um, a known well with an impact. We will continue to to move out, and to the extent that we find other other private well owners that are are allowing us access, we will sample those. Um, uh, but I think we we do have cases where um, we aren't being allowed it, allowed to sample. So we we try to um, persuade. We try to. Uh, provide information um, to to reassure them about the kind of work we're doing and and um, the benefits of allowing us to sample. And but, another question from oh sorry are you done? I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. From, uh, from Michelle Paul has Mass DEP been contacted following Northeastern University's publication identifying over fifty seven thousand likely PFAS sites across the state. Uh, I don't believe so. I, I, do you want to say anything more about that, Michelle, what, in terms of being no. notified? Yeah, no, I mean, um, we we had been asked um, if we had any reaction to it because there are 30 sites within the city of, of New Bedford in that study. Um, so I didn't know if, if other cities or towns had reached out to MassDEP because now people are are contacting them, but the the links to those studies are um, are in the chat as well. Okay. I was I, I was just curious if we were the only ones being contacted about. So what are you doing about it? No, I I have not heard that. That doesn't mean it it hasn't there isn't someone in the regional office that has been contacted. I will I can follow up on that. We're, I'm meeting with the. Um, the deputy regional directors next week. So we'll see what they've heard about that. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, so the these program measures, uh, this is something that we typically do this time of year at the end of the year. Usually we repeat what we have um, presented at the LSP Association annual kickoff meeting. Um, we never got to, these um, at that meeting in September, but I, I did I did run through them at our um, September office hours. So I apologize to those of you who have seen them. Um, I think they're always kind of interesting to look at and I won't provide much commentary, just kind of quickly, quickly um, run through them. But um, so this, this uh, graph here shows the trends in terms of notifications uh, plotted with closures over time. Uh, so you, you can note here that in the in the past couple of years, the it, usually the, these lines have converged in the last few years. Um, there's slight uptick in terms of notifications more recently. This uh, here shows uh, the total of notifications, uh, but it also breaks it down uh, by whether it was a, a two hour, 120 day or 72 hour notification. And I think from this, you can tell that the recent uptake in notifications appears to be as a result of some additional two hour notifications. Um, I think you could speculate that, that that may uh, likely be uh, related to PFAS notifications and eminent hazards. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one in terms of release abatement measure plans, which 
are a measure of um, a, a lot of cleanup work that happens under the program, and in particular, a lot of cleanup work associated with construction activities. So in, in one respect, it's also kind of a measure of, of uh, how much work is happening and, and, and economic, um, economic drivers in terms of work happening. And uh, what, what is interesting in this is, is it also shows you the number of plans being received by the different regional offices. And uh, the one up top um, with, the, with the upward trend is the Northeast Regional Office. This, oh, I can't see my own header. What is this? Immediate response action plans uh, by year. Uh, I also put in there the, um, the number of exposure pathway mitigation measure registrations by year. Uh, these, we only started tracking these when the regulations went into effect in 2014 that allowed for the use of sub slab depressurization systems to address vapor intrusion um, as part of um, permanent solutions. And we also require registration if they're being used to support temporary solutions or remedy operation status. Um, so there was a real, a real uh, peak back in 2017. Um, and this is the, um, the number of um, audits being conducted by MassDP. Um, by audit type, you can see there on the bar, the blue being um, the level one screening audit. Uh, the purple, the, the, the level two audit inspection, that would include um, inspecting uh, a site visit and, and inspecting the site, and the level three, the green, is the comprehensive audit. So there's just, uh, in 2022, um, slightly more audits were conducted than the prior year. And this just breaks them down uh, again by type. You can see there was an increase um, in the number of comprehensive audits that were conducted, <clears throat> excuse me, last year. Uh, and this is um, the uh, percentage of closures that uh, included an activity and use limitation. So there, um, so activity and use limitations by year as part of a permanent solution and um, the percentage overall um, that where the permanent solution included an activity and use limitation. Uh, this is the total closures. Um, so you can see that the, the majority of closures, as we know, are permanent solutions that involve no conditions and <clears throat> folded into this are not only the, um, you know, the more complicated um, site cleanups and closures, but also the responses to sudden releases. So that, <clears throat> that really drives the numbers in terms of overall closures and, and those that are closed with no conditions. And this is the trend over time for sites that have um, uh, notified and then cleaned up and, um, uh, in, and the number of years it takes them to get to closure. And then if the colors there show you based on the, based on the um, way it was initially uh, became notified to us, whether two hour, 72 hour, 120 day, the blue, are those sites that predated the the new program, the new program in 1993? So um, you can see some of the sites that are hanging out there for um, many years beyond 20 years are really those that um, we had before we before we implemented the privatized program. And uh, this is, I think, the final slide, and it just shows where where sites are now um, six years from notification. And uh, if you add together the, those that have achieved a permanent solution, the 81% and, and the other uh, 
bigger piece here, the 12% permanent solution not required, uh, those, those, would be, um, uh, those would be RTNs that are associated with the, the same RTN, uh, so they wouldn't need a separate permanent solution. Um, you can see that uh, the overall numbers in terms of the number that are achieving permanent solution in the six year time frame is, is still very high. And, and oops, so uh, that's it. I think I'll, I'll stop again, and see if anyone had any commentary on the, the statistics. Okay.